Hello students, this is Dr. Lyons and welcome to what I'm sure will be an incredibly fascinating video lecture on estuaries. So we are in the uh, in the, the ecosystem part of the, the course right now. Uh, in, the, in the last chapter we talked about intertidal zones, in this chapter we're going to talk about estuaries. Uh, and so estuaries are places that look like this where you have water enclosed by land, specifically ocean water uh, enclosed by land. So these are, are places that are, are at least semi-enclosed. So they're areas where, where you have fresh water coming from the, from the land, mixing with seawater coming from the ocean. So for instance, Morro Bay in, in, uh, in Central California, Right, so you have this bay right here, you have fresh water going into it in the form of rainfall, and then you have ocean water going into it from the ocean. A little bit further north in what's known as Yaquina Bay in Oregon, uh, you have the Yaquina River that's taking water into the bay and then ocean water coming in from the ocean going in. So there's a, a mix of fresh water and seawater inside of estuaries. Some of the general characteristics we find in estuaries uh, is that there's a big amount of tidal influence. So we just learned in the last chapter about how tides going up and down can have a big effect on marine animals and plants. Uh, and that can happen in rocky intertidal areas. It can happen in estuaries as, as well. Uh, in, in estuaries, you find big swings in salinity, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Uh, you can have big swings in the temperature of the water in, in big swings in terms of it being exposed to air, then being exposed to water uh, on, a, on a daily basis as a result of those tides. Uh, what you do find in a lot of estuaries is soft sediment. Uh, so when you have uh, rivers going into estuaries that are, that are transporting lots of sediment from the land, you end up with lots and lots of soft sediment, like muddy seafloors inside of estuaries. Uh, kind of what, one of maybe the, the more interesting aspects of estuaries is that in general, they don't have a lot of species diversity, meaning that there's not a lot of different types of, of animals and plants that live there. However, they do have a large amount of productivity, uh, meaning that what few species are there, uh, there is a lot of them. Uh, so you find a lot of things living in estuaries, but you know not just a great variety of living things inside of estuaries. And we'll talk a little bit later about why that why that is why it is that there's so much productivity in estuaries. Okay, one of the the probably the the probably one of the the most important characteristics of estuaries has to do with salinity. You know because uh, estuaries are are characterized by being a place where fresh water mixes with salt water, uh, you will find inside of estuaries major salinity gradients from fully saline ocean water to very fresh uh, river water. Uh, so this is the whole of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, which is a large bay on the east coast of the United States. Uh, so here's a small map of it. So Chesapeake Bay sits between uh, Delaware is over here Maryland is on the is on the top, uh, and then Virginia is kind of down uh, down here. Okay, uh, and in blue means fully salty. So like down here in the in the opening in the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, it's completely saline. But then if you go really far up into the rivers to connect to it, like the Potomac River, which runs next to our next to our capital, you have water which is is completely fresh. So you have this mix of, of salinity, this salinity gradient going from very fresh to very salty water. So there's a few different types of estuaries that I want to talk about. Uh, so one type of estuary are what are known as drowned river valleys. So drowned river valleys form when, uh, when the sea level goes up and down. So if you were to go back in time 10,000 years ago, the sea level was 300 feet lower than it is today. So places like the Chesapeake Bay, for instance, which we just talked about, uh, the Chesapeake Bay would have been completely dry 10,000 years ago. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay would have been a river valley with this, this deep valley with a, with a river running through or several rivers running through the middle of it. 
but over the last 10,000 years, you know, the sea levels come up and up and up. Uh, and essentially, so that essentially that river valley that was there has now been completely filled in by water. It's been drowned. Uh, so now it's not dry land anymore. Now it's an estuary. Uh, so that's that's what a drowned river valley is. Uh, another type are what are known as bar built estuaries. So these are places where sand has accumulated to form what are known as barrier islands. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, here in this is what's known as Long Island. So this is part of New York. So what, what you're seeing here is, is, the, is kind of the tri-state area. So New York City is right there. Connecticut is up here. Uh, New Jersey is down here. And then the rest of like upstate New York is up here. So like Manhattan is, is this tiny little island right there, for instance. So Manhattan's there, Brooklyn is there, Queens is there, uh, the Bronx are up there. Uh, and then this whole, uh, this whole island is what's known as Long Island. It's part of New York. Uh, and, the very, and along the whole south of Long Island is what's known as Great South Bay. Uh, and Great South Bay is a bar-built estuary uh, because you have these long sandbars that run the whole length of the southern end of, of Long Island. Uh, and those sandbars then trap this water inside of here, which is, which is known as Great South Bay. Uh, so that's a bar-built estuary. Uh, the whole outer part of, of North and South Carolina uh, has bar-built estuaries. For instance, the area known as Cape Hatteras is a bar-built estuary. Uh, so that's what, what these are. Uh, tectonic estuaries uh, form as a result of tectonic activity. Uh, so this results from, uh, from land sinking uh, as a result of pieces of the Earth's crust moving around. So San Francisco Bay is a really good example of this, right? So here's obviously the Golden Gate Bridge and, and, and San Francisco. Uh, and in this whole bay, uh, formed from that, from the land that is there sinking down into the, into the, you know, getting lower and lower. Uh, because as, as many of you know, the San Francisco area is a very tectonically active area uh, because the, the fault line is, is very close there. So the fault line between the North American plate and the Pacific plate runs very, very close to San Francisco. Uh, which is why, you know, there was a big earthquake there in the 80s that, that interrupted a World Series game. Uh, there was an even bigger earthquake in the early 1900s that really destroyed the better part of the city. You know, it's a tectonically active area. Uh, and as a result, you have this bay there uh, as a result of the earth sinking because of all this tectonic movement. Uh, the last type of estuary I want to talk about are fjords. Uh, so fjord comes from a Norwegian word, uh, which is why, you know, there's this weird J there. Uh, so Scandinavian languages um, and, and other European languages use J's a lot more than we, than we use in English. Uh, so when you see a J after a consonant in a Scandinavian word, the, the J uh, refer, like you pronounce it as kind of like a, like a E, like fjords, uh, fjords. So that's what that word is. Uh, and these are only in cold areas. Uh, and how fjords form is by glaciers scraping uh, out the sea floor. So essentially you've got a glacier. Uh, glaciers form as a result of, you know, snow falling on the land, you know, becoming compressed and turning into ice. Uh, and then those glaciers move very gradually towards the ocean. Uh, and so the glaciers and the immense weight of the glaciers and all that ice scrapes the, the ground underneath them and scrapes all of the sand and rocks out into the ocean. Uh, and, and by doing so, they can actually scrape away uh, uh, land, making it below the sea level. And if it scrapes out enough of that, then water can fill in and make that a fjord. So fjords essentially occur in places where a glacier used to be. Uh, the glacier has, has gone away, but, but you see its remnant in that it's scraped away the, the, the earth. So that now there's this depression uh, that, that, that causes there to be water uh, in there because it's below sea level. Uh, and in the mouth of fjords tend to be shallower than the rest of the estuary because a lot of the the rocks and sand that were here have been scraped into that particular area by the glacier. Uh, so that's what a, what a fjord is. 
so you're only going to find that in cold places like Alaska, Norway, New Zealand, Iceland, Greenland, places like that. Okay, so what we're going to talk about for the rest of the chapter uh, are challenges inside of estuaries. So the, the biggest challenge to things that live inside of estuaries are, sal are, are salinity swings. Uh, and so there's kind of two important things that I want you to consider here. Uh, the first important thing is the density of salt water versus the density of fresh water. Right, so you'll remember all the way back from, I guess it's probably chapter four and in the first lab that we did, uh, that salt water is more dense than fresh water. As a result, salt water, water will sit underneath fresh water. So a really important thing here is that if you were, say, a fish hanging out here on the sea floor, uh, you would be in completely saline water, like 35 parts per thousand water. If you're just to swim up towards the surface, now you would be in 15 parts per thousand water. Uh, and that results from the density of salt water and fresh water. It'll be denser closer to the bottom uh, than, than towards the surface. Uh, and what you'll see in estuaries is salt water will kind of wedge itself underneath, right? So salt water coming from the ocean will wedge underneath the river water coming from land that is that is fresh. Uh, two other important things to consider is tides and related to tides, the movement of water. Right, so tides uh, affect estuaries because water goes in from the ocean and then comes back out. So it goes in and out and in and out. So in this image you see on the top, this is during high tide when a lot of seawater has gone into the estuary. So right now this little crab on the seafloor uh, is experiencing completely saline water, right? So that's 35 parts per thousand water. But then when we have low tide, when the salt water retreats, right? The salt water goes down, so the water level is lower. Now this crab is in 15 parts per thousand water. Right, so in six hours, the crab's gone from 35 to 15. Right, so a big, big swing in, in salinity. Uh, and so that kind of relates to how organisms in the ocean deal with salinity in general. So there's kind of two ways that things do this. So there are organisms that are what are known as stenohaline, uh, where they can only tolerate a very narrow range of salinities. And then there are organisms that are urihaline. Uh, you can think uri kind of sounds like many. So urihaline organisms can tolerate a wide range of salinities, right? So they can tolerate many salinities, right? So you should, if you know, so a, a question to you is, is things inside of estuaries, would you expect them to be stenohaline or urihaline? So the, I would think the fairly obvious answer is that they're urihaline. Uh, because they live in an area where the salinity swings up and down a lot. Uh, and as a result, they need to be urihaline in order to survive in that area. Okay, and then of urihaline organisms, uh, there's kind of two ways that you can do it. You can be what's known as an osmoconformer uh, or an osmoregulator. So osmo refers to uh, osmolarity, refers to like the amount of salt inside of water. Uh, in to conform is to, you know, to kind of go with, to regulate is to, to control what's going on. So osmo conformers, they just conform to whatever the salinity is outside. So if, if it's really salty outside of them, they're going to be really salty on the inside. If it's really fresh outside, they're going to be fresh on the inside. Whereas the osmo regulator, uh, is controlling the its internal salinity, right? So it'll it'll control just how salty uh, it is on the inside. So there's a I want to talk just briefly about lionfish here because they're kind of interesting uh, uh, in, in in ways related to this, right? So lionfish are you know are typically more coral reef fish, not estuarine fish. So as a result of that, we would expect them to be stenohaline, right? We would expect them to only be able to survive a narrow range of salinities because they live on coral reefs where there tends to be a very narrow range of salinities. However, it's been found that invasive lionfish can live in salinities as low as five parts per thousand. So in fact, it would appear that lionfish are actually urihaline, uh, which is very surprising because they are coral reef fish. So there are concerns about this uh, because 
Uh, we typically think of lionfish as only having negative effects on coral reefs, but they can also have effects on estuaries as well, particularly the estuaries of Florida. Right, so this, this is a picture from an estuary in Florida, and there's a lionfish living in it quite happily. Uh, which is why you should all eat lionfish like I do, or at least like I do when I have a chance. Okay, so I want to kind of get you to see graphically how osmoconformers and how osmoregulators look on, on this graph. So on the horizontal axis, we have the salinity of the outside water. So the salinity outside of a living organism in parts per thousand. Uh, on the vertical axis, we have the salinity of the blood of that living thing, right? So just how salty are they on the inside? So let's think first about an osmoconformer, right? So an osmoconformer, right? They uh, just whatever the salinity is outside, uh, they are going to have the same salinity on the inside, right? So think about the line for osmoconformers. Is it going to be is it going to be flat? Is it going to be up and down? Is it going to be kind of at an angle? What do you you know what do you think? So what it's going to be you know so if it's say zero parts per thousand outside of them, they're going to be zero parts per thousand on the inside. If it's thirty two parts per thousand on the outside they're going to be 32 parts per thousand on the on the inside. So the line for osmoconformers is going to look something like this. You know, as salinity outside of them increases, so does the salinity inside of them. So if it's zero parts per thousand outside, there's zero on the inside. If it's 32 parts per thousand on the outside, they're going to be 32 parts per thousand on the inside. Now let's think about the, the osmoregulators. So if uh, so, if it's say zero, you know, zero parts per thousand outside, you know, they're still going to be, you know, somewhere, say, 10 parts per thousand. If it's really salty on the outside, say 32 parts per thousand, they regulate and they're still around, say, 10 parts per thousand. So an osmoregulator is going to look something more like this. It's going to look more like a like a flat line uh, because because they don't change with the outside salinity. You know, they keep a constant, you know, uh, internal salinity across a broad range of external salinities. Okay, and then this is just showing the, the you know, that same thing. Um, uh, this just, this does show one kind of additional wrinkle uh, in that there are things that are perfect osmoconformers, like, like a lot of worms, uh, they just completely conform. Uh, there are perfect osmoregulators, like a lot of fishes, and then there are some things that are in the middle. So like a crab uh, will be able to regulate, you know, across a band of salinity, say from like 10 up to 25. But if it goes beyond that, beyond that, then it can't control it. Then its salinity, internal salinity goes up. Uh, and if the salinity is below that, its salinity starts to, to go down. So it can regulate across a narrow range, like say 10 to 25, but it can't regulate across all salinities. Whereas something like an eel or a salmon, they can regulate across all salinities. Okay, so another challenge uh, that organisms face inside of estuaries uh, is that a lot of them will be exposed to air at certain times of, uh, of the day you know, just like rocky intertidal organisms will. So they have to either be able to hide or move or just tolerate being out in the air. Uh, so these things right here, uh, they are uh, they're pr particularly interesting animals uh, in terms of this. Uh, so this is what's known as a, as a mud skipper. Uh, and they're called that because they kind of skip al along over the over the mud. Uh, and what these things do is they kind of act in the opposite way from a scuba diver, right? So when a scuba diving human, what they do is they take a supply of air with them underwater, uh, and they wear goggles that allow them to see under the water. Uh, these mud skippers they fill them their mouth cavity with with water so that they have a supply of water when they're walking around on land. Uh, in their little eyeballs, uh, what they do is they can fold their eyeballs inside of these little cavities that, that keep them nice and moist. 
because uh, the eyes of a fish will dry out if they're if they're in the air and they can't re-wet themselves. So they kind of do the very opposite thing from scuba divers, right? So scuba divers have a tank filled with air and they have goggles that have air inside of them. Uh, whereas mud skippers have a tank of water inside of their mouth uh, and they have ways of keeping their eyes wet so that they can see when they're above water. So they're really pretty, pretty interesting fish. Okay, so those were the challenges of estuaries. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits of estuaries, right? If, if there's, you know, a lot of salinity swings and there's exposure to air and temperature changes around a lot, you know, why would anything choose to live there? Uh, and so a lot of why things will live inside of estuaries is because there tends to be an abundance of food. Uh, and why that is, is because there's a lot of nutrients, right? So you have all of this land here with all of these plants. Uh, and the nutrients that those plants produce will be leaching into the water, right? So you have uh, this really nutrient-rich water inside of estuaries because you have a lot of nutrients that are in the, uh, in the soil that, that goes into the, the water. So because there's a lot of nutrients, there'll be a lot of food because that'll then make it such that there is a lot of plankton in the water, right? So the nutrients will lead to lots of uh, phytoplankton, the phytoplankton will lead to lots of zooplankton. Uh, and then things like small fish will come into estuaries to eat those small zooplankton, right? So that's one reason why estuaries are so useful. Uh, another reason is that there is a lot of shelter to be had inside of estuaries, right? So there are all these kind of small nooks and crannies and, and grasses that you can hide in if you're a small fish uh, or any sort of small animal. Right, so that's why a lot of things will live inside of estuaries is because there's a lot of food and there's a lot of places to hide uh, inside of them. Uh, estuaries are oftentimes also uh, a major place for migratory birds uh, to go to. Uh, so these are pictures from the, from the east coast of the United States. Uh, so this is a picture from the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and all of these things that you see in here are horseshoe crabs. Uh, we talked very briefly about horseshoe crabs back in chapter seven. Uh, they are a type of arthropod, right? So they're relatives of insects and crabs and things like that. Uh, and during spring and summer times, uh, you'll see big aggregations of horseshoe crabs like this. Uh, and what these crabs are doing is they're reproducing. Uh, this is basically a big crab orgy. Uh, and, and what those crabs do is the females will lay eggs into the sand and the males will, will fertilize those eggs. So migratory birds will time their migration routes to make sure that they go to this estuary, you know, after the females have laid their eggs, uh, because then there is this huge source of food in the estuaries for the birds to eat uh, as they are moving, you know, north and south between like the, the tropics in the, in the Arctic. Uh, and you can see these birds here that are all eating the eggs of these, uh, you know, of these uh, horseshoe crabs. So estuaries are kind of like in and out burgers, right? So imagine, you know, you're driving on the highway and you're getting kind of hungry. Maybe you're getting a little hangry too. And you see in and out burger, you stop in so that you can fuel your body and keep going. Uh, that's what birds use estuaries for, right? So these migratory birds stop over in estuaries to refuel themselves so they can keep making their, their journey either north or south. Okay, so we've talked a lot about like salt marshes and mangroves, seagrasses. We've talked a little bit about mudflats. You find all of those different types of habitats inside of estuaries. Uh, and there's just a, a couple that I, or I wanted to talk about some interesting things that go on inside of a couple of those. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the ecology of what goes inside of those estuarine habitats. So as a, as a reminder, ecology, we, we talked about that back in, uh, in chapter 10. Uh, and that describes the interaction between uh, organisms, you know, whether it be animals or plants or bacteria or whatever, uh, between them and their surrounding environments. So the living things around them or the non-living things around them. So salt marshes uh, in those salt marshes that are inside of estuaries, uh, they've actually become a really important area uh, of research for ecology. Uh, in particular, this guy whose name is Mark Burtness, uh, 
uh, he's done some really interesting research on salt marsh ecology. And what he has found is that inside of salt marshes, something known as facilitation is really important. So facilitation is, is kind of related to mutualism, right? We've talked about mutualism and symbiosis as, as things uh, kind of helping each other out, uh, like animals or plants helping each other out in very direct ways. Facilitation is like that, but it, it tends to be in a, in a less direct way. So let me explain what's going on here with, uh, with, these, with these animals uh, in these plants. So first of all, we have the plants that live inside of salt marshes. Uh, and the thing that they do that is useful for other things in the area is they stabilize all of this mud and sand that's right here. Right, so the roots of these plants, they keep all of that mud in place, right? So instead of that mud moving around, it stays right in place. So there's a stable shelter for things to live in because of what the plants are doing. Then you have fiddler crabs, such as this one. What these fiddler crabs do is they dig little burrows in the sand, little holes in the sand that they can use to hide, for pred hide from predators uh, and that they use for reproduction. Uh, and the, in the, the holes of, you know, many, many fiddler crabs aerates the soil so that water can get down deep into the soil. Uh, and what that does is it aerates the soil so that there can be plenty of nutrients inside of that sediment. Uh, that is really good for the plants because the plants need those nutrients in order to survive. Uh, you know, just like, you know, f like fields and lawns are often aerated to, to keep the grass healthy. Uh, these fiddler crabs aerates the sand around these plants and that helps the plants to keep them healthy. Then we have mussels, so these dark things that you see in and amongst the, the grass. Uh, these mussels, uh, they fertilize the sediment with their poop because what the mussels do is they filter feed. Right? So we've learned all about filter feeding and we learned all about mussels uh, and clams. Right? So they're sucking up nutrients out of the water and food out of the water. Uh, and so the poop that they create is really nutrient rich. Uh, and this nutrient rich poop, uh, you know, is really good for the plants that are here, right? So all three of these organisms are kind of helping out the other ones, uh, but it's, it's in kind of uh, indirect ways. Uh, whereas when we talked about mutualism, like between shrimps and gobies, you know, that is helping each other out in a very, very direct way. So anyway, so this is facilitation, and, and this is something that's important inside of salt marshes, inside of estuaries. Okay, another interesting thing that goes on inside of salt marshes, particularly uh, salt marshes in the West Coast, uh, is, is, is that something that's been noticed as of late uh, is that there's been a lot of marsh, salt marsh dieback, uh, die back, meaning that the marsh goes away. Uh, is a result of this crab, which is known as a lined shore crab. So unlike the fiddler crabs uh, that help out salt marsh plants, these crabs are not so good for the salt marsh plants because they actually eat the roots of the, of the grass. Uh, and if the, the grass loses its roots, then it goes away. So things like pickleweed, which you can find in, in, uh, in salt marshes and estuaries on the east coast, uh, I'm sorry, not on the east coast, here on the west coast, uh, if you have these crabs around, they eat the pickleweed and the pickleweed goes away. Uh, and when you have lots and lots of crabs, then you remove all this pickleweed and now there's nothing to, uh, to hold the sediment in place. So then the salt marsh goes away, it dies back. However, it's been found that there's been a recent reversal of this. Uh, that it's been found that a lot of salt marshes on the west coast of the United States are starting to recover. Uh, in the, in, and why they're recovering is kind of interesting. Uh, why they're recovering is because of sea otters, right? So sea otters have, you know, become more and more populated throughout the West Coast uh, because uh, we're not hunting for them anymore, right? So we stopped hunting for sea otters back in the early 1900s, and now they've become to, you know, started recovering throughout the West Coast. And they're being found inside of estuaries more and more. Uh, and so what these sea otters do is they eat the crabs uh, and they keep the population of crabs in check so that the crabs can't destroy all of the, the pickle weed. Right. This is kind of a this is a similar story to the one that you learned in the lab recently. Uh, 
uh, you learned about sea stars and about mussels and about uh, seaweeds, right? So you learned that sea stars eat the mussels uh, and the mussels, because their, their population is limited by the sea stars, that means that other things like seaweeds have a chance of growing in rocky and tidal areas. Uh, it's not such a different story from here, right? So the sea otters, their effect is controlling this one thing. Uh, and by this one thing being controlled, now other things can survive in that, that area. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what this area known as Elkhorn uh, Slough, which is up in central uh, California. Uh, some researchers did a, a very simple but very elegant research experiment to kind of figure out what was going on here, uh, what this what the story was that was going on inside of this estuary, this place known as Elkhorn Slough. So they did something really, really elegant. Uh, what they did was they put cages inside of the estuary. Uh, and so those cages essentially keep, uh, allow crabs to go in and out, right? So crabs can go inside the cage and outside of the cage, but sea otters are unable to get into the cage, right? So sea otters can eat crabs on the outside of the cage, but they can't eat any crabs on the inside of the cage. Right. So what do you think would happen where, you know, after you put these cages in place, what would happen to the to the to the seagrass uh, inside of this this cage? Well, the obvious answer should be that the seagrass goes away. Right. So inside the cage, you have all the, the crabs can live quite happily there because the sea otters can't get to them. So the crabs in that area destroy all of the grass and the grass goes away. Whereas outside the cage, the sea otters can eat those crabs. They can limit their abundance so that now outside of the, the cage, the crabs are not, you know, eating all of the, the seagrass. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about in the estuaries chapter is just a little bit more about the effect of humans on estuaries. So estuaries, unfortunately, are some of the most impacted ecosystems on the planet. Uh, and there's kind of two reasons for that. First reason is that they tend to be very in very close proximity to lots of humans. Right. If you look at, you know, great civilizations throughout time, they tended to be very close to water. Uh, and if you look, you know, today at large modern cities, they tend to be really close to water. The reason why is that goods can be traded on water and, and people move around using water. Uh, so, so access to water has been a hallmark of major you know, civilizations and major cities. So for instance, if we look at like New York City, uh, about 8.4 million people live uh, in, in the New York City area, right? So, so in Manhattan, uh, Bronx, Queen, Brooklyn, uh, and then in, in Staten Island, right? So 8.4 million people living around this narrow, very small waterway. Uh, in the Bay Area, you know, there's 7.1 you know, million people living, you know, either in San Francisco or Oakland or, or Berkeley or Palo Alto or, or whatnot, right? So there's a lot of people living in that, in that area. And when you have that many people, you know, living that close to, to an ecosystem, it's pretty hard for the people to not have an impact on that ecosystem. You know, just by the by there being so many people there, you know, eating and pooping and doing all the things that humans do, you know, disposing of trash in, in, in less than, than optimal ways, you know, that those ecosystems are going to be affected. Uh, another reason why ecosystems, I'm sorry, why estuaries tend to be very affected ecosystems is because of their semi-enclosed nature. So pollutants and, and trash tend to get trapped inside of estuaries uh, because of their semi-enclosed nature, right? So for instance, if, if you went to Marina del Rey and you improperly disposed of, of I don't know, a, a bag of, of hot Cheetos, right? That bag probably is gonna stay inside of that estuary for a long time. Uh, it's gonna sink to the bottom and it's gonna stay trapped there. Uh, whereas if you, you know, were to improperly dispose of your hot Cheeto bag on the beach, you know, it might get dispersed, you know, out into the ocean uh, and we, it would go away from that beach. You know, it would still have an effect on the ocean, but it might not have an immediate effect on the beach. Uh, 
so estuaries are oftentimes very heavily Im Im impacted by humans because of their enclosed nature, right? So pollutants and trash that go into them tend to stay inside of them. Uh, and that's why when you look at the water inside of Marina del Rey, it often looks pretty damn nasty. Uh, and that's because of its semi-enclosed nature and because you have, you know, tons of humans living around Marina del Rey. Uh, Marina del Rey, you know, is not even completely natural to begin with. You know, you can tell by the very square shape of it uh, that it's not even really a, a completely, you know, natural waterway. There was a small estuary back here at, at one point and one over here in the Bayona wetlands. Uh, but the current shape of Marina del Rey is definitely not natural. So there tends to be, uh, uh, like I was saying, because of the semi-enclosed nature of estuaries, uh, you tend to find lots of problems with toxic chemicals and lots of nutrient pollution inside of them. So, uh, so a, a common chemical found inside of estuaries are what are known as PCBs. So PCBs are, are polychlorinated biphenyls. Uh, you know, don't worry about that whole thing. Just worry about the PCB part. Uh, and PCBs are a byproduct of, of industry, a byproduct of having factories. Uh, and they are incredibly toxic, you know, not just to humans, but also to us. So that's why certain estuaries uh, are not really great places for fishing in. Uh, because if an estuary has a lot of PCBs in it, you absolutely do not want to eat anything that came from that estuary uh, because PCBs are very, very, very bad for you. So there can be lots of PCBs and other chemicals inside of estuaries. There can also be a lot of nutrient pollution, which leads to what's known as eutrophication. Uh, eutrophication is an accumulation of lots of nutrients. Uh, and that can lead to what's known as anoxia. So let's break down this word anoxia. So the oxia part should sound like a type of atom that you need a lot of. That atom I'm talking about is oxygen. And, and you know that when you put the letter A in front of something, it means to not have that, to be without it. So anoxia means to, for there to be a not a lot of water. I'm sorry, not a lot of oxygen. Uh, and that can result from, from eutrophication. Uh, and that can lead to something like this. Uh, so let me explain what's going on here. So what you see is a bunch of dead fish. Uh, and this is, uh, these dead fish were inside of what's known as uh, Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. Uh, so this happened in the, in the early 2000s. All these fish died and washed ashore uh, inside of Narragansett Bay. Uh, and so what happened? Uh, is that in Narragansett Bay, there was a big spike in nutrients because there was a really big storm that washed a lot of nutrients from the land down into the water. So that leads to eutrophication, lots of nutrients in the water. Uh, then those nutrients, uh, because they're there, that causes a big boom in phytoplankton. So you have tons and tons and tons of phytoplankton in the water, all using up those nutrients. When all of that phytoplankton, uh, when that phytoplankton eats up all of those nutrients, all of them die because they don't have any nutrients left to, to support their massive numbers. So they die and they sink to the bottom. Uh, once they're on the bottom, then bacteria come along and start to eat all of the dead bodies of all of those, uh, of all of that phytoplankton. Because uh, bacteria act as decomposers, so they take dead things and they break them down. Uh, and the thing about bacteria is that most types of bacteria kind of work the same way as us. They breathe in oxygen and they use that oxygen in order to break down their food. So essentially you have all these bacteria eating all of these phytoplankton uh, and phytoplankton are there because of nutrient pollution. So when you have tons and tons of bacteria eating tons and tons of dead phytoplankton, all of that bacteria eats up all of the oxygen that's in the water. So you end up with anoxia or what's known as hypoxia, which is a low amount of oxygen. So you can have these areas on the seafloor that are known as dead zones where there's no oxygen. And if a big school of fish happens to swim through that dead zone, then all of the fish suffocate because now there's, there's no oxygen for them. And that's exactly what happened here. You've got all these dead fish resulting from uh, a lack of oxygen in the water, which results from eutrophication.
Uh, of course, solid pollution can be a problem for estuaries, you know, hot Cheeto bags and, and uh, you know, hot Taki bags and, and, I don't know, cars and trucks and whatever gets dumped into estuaries. Uh, harvesting certain organisms can have a really negative effect on estuaries, right? So we've learned about bivalves and talked about them a few different times. Uh, you know, bivalves such as oysters and clams, they clean up water because they're filter feeders. Uh, and you tend to find lots of them inside of estuaries. However, a lot of those bivalves have been lost because unfortunately for a lot of bivalves, they happen to be incredibly delicious. So in a lot of places like Chesapeake Bay, there used to be tons and tons of oysters. Now there's not a lot because we ate all of them. Uh, and when you have the loss of that organism that cleans the water, you know, that makes the water quality even worse because now its natural filtration system is now gone. Uh, sediment being, being dredged and moved around can be an issue too. Uh, so dredging refers to, you know, picking up, you know, set sand and mud off the seafloor and moving it somewhere else. Why this is done is because uh, you will have channels going into estuaries. Uh, and sometimes those channels can be too shallow to let large boats in and out. So ships uh, such as this, which is a dredging ship, will suck sand uh, and mud off the seafloor and go dump it somewhere else. Of course, that is incredibly disruptive because now you're sucking up all of the animals and plants off the seafloor and, and putting them somewhere else. Uh, and, and it tends to be the case that all of that mud and sediment is in that area for a reason. Uh, because that's just where water currents tend to move it to. So you end up having the case where you need to keep dredging over and over and over again because sand and, and mud is going to keep accumulating in that area where you don't want it to. right? So that is incredibly, dis incredibly disruptive because you're moving around animals and plants from their natural area. Uh, of course, development uh, can, can have an effect on estuaries. Right? When we develop in areas and put, you know, docks and, and other shit in, in the ocean, you know, that's going to have an effect on, on the estuary, of course. Okay, one last thing I want to talk about uh, are tidal boards, uh, kind of just a, as a sort of interesting phenomenon of estuaries. So tidal boards result uh, when you have uh, really, really big tides that rush into a river against the natch or into an estuary against the natural flow of a river out to sea, right? So natural rivers, the fresh water runs out to the ocean. But then when you have an incoming high tide, uh, that is a really big incoming high tide, it causes these things known as tidal bores. So you have this really big standing wave that goes up an estuary and up a river. Uh, and, and these can be pretty large. So for instance, in what's known as the Kuantang River uh, in China, uh, there are these huge, huge tidal bores that go up into the river during the times of year when the spring tides are the greatest. Uh, and these are actually large enough to surf on. So surfers will actually go on them uh, if the surfer, you know, doesn't mind going in this incredibly nasty looking water, uh, of course. Uh, so this video that I was going to show you of a tidal bore, I will, I will post on, on Canvas for you to watch uh, because they are, you know, pretty fascinating uh, phenomena. Okay, so that's all I've got to tell you about estuaries. Uh, in the next chapter, we're going to start to talk uh, a little bit more about some of the other ecosystems, such as uh, coral reefs and, and continental shelves uh, in places such as that.